greatest of all time. Seems like every sport nowadays is having some kind of discussion about who is the greatest athlete that's ever played, ever participated. Sometimes it's a relatively easy conversation. You have athletes such as Don Bradman, who was so statistically dominant compared to literally everyone else who has played the entire sport that it's crazy to think that someone like him even exists. And then you have people with the title of GOAT like this guy because he plays under Bill Belichick. But of course, we're not here for those sports. We're here for NASCAR. And NASCAR has surely had its fair share of great drivers. I mean, from Lee Petty to Richard Petty, the king, from Cale Yarborough to the Silver Fox, David Pearson, from Bobby Allison to his son, Davey, and from Darrell Waltrip to well, whoever raced this car. I don't really remember. Um, but of course, especially now in 2020, the focus has shifted away from any of these drivers to one that is a lot more recent. And in fact, racing right now, Jimmy Johnson. I'm sure that didn't surprise you in the slightest. I should probably start here by saying, this is not an argument of why Jimmy Johnson isn't a great driver. He is. This is looking into whether or not Jimmy Johnson is this good. You know, this good. And when we talk about Jimmy Johnson, we have to start somewhere. This is the obvious starting point, right? This is the main argument that everyone has for why Jimmy Johnson is the best. I think when it comes to determining who is the greatest driver of all time, 99% of fans would agree that that label should be given to the most skilled driver, the driver who has showcased the fact that he is in fact the best at handling a race car. And what happens with Jimmy Johnson is that everyone believes that these seven trophies are the best proof that Jimmy Johnson is really good at driving a race car. And that is to some extent true. But of course, most people treat these championships as if they are the pinnacle, the best absolute evidence of how skilled a driver is. This is the time to really think about why you think that way. Because objectively, that's false. And I get it. I know what's going to happen right about here. I'm going to get a bunch of people that are going to either think or write me comments saying something along these lines. You're just sad that Jimmy Johnson won so much. You're just a hater. He won those championships fair and square. He played the system, and now he's a big winner, and you just root for a driver that's no good, and you're just mad about it. They just think that I'm just going to cry about how unfair the playoff system is for the rest of this video. No. This is not about anything along those lines. This is not the time to figure out whether the playoffs are the best system, whether they're a good system. It doesn't matter. Here's the other part. This is not a discussion about whether Jimmy Johnson earned those championships. Jimmy Johnson won seven. Okay, we're past that now, right? So here's the next part. What if I told you that Jimmy Johnson raced against somebody, in fact, for a good chunk of his career, that for all intents and purposes, and considering all the statistics available, had a lot more success generally? Oh, now I just need to figure out who that driver is. Ah, uh, gosh. Yeah, he started out pretty young. I think he was from California, raced for Bill Davis for a while. 
Then he got his start at Hendrick, just like Jimmy Johnson. Gosh, yeah, he was with the Rainbow Warriors. Ray Evernham was his crew chief for a while. Gosh, he won a whole bunch of races, some championships. Gosh, who could that be? Who could that driver be? That's right, it's Jeff Gordon. Ah, oh, yep. Now we made it to this point in the video. Pretty fast, right? We're just going to have a whole extra wave of, Oh my gosh, you're just a Jeff Gordon fan that hates that Jimmy Johnson beat him for his entire career. And you just want to make Jimmy look bad so Jeff looks better. You're kind of right, actually. But I'm not here to just talk smack about Jimmy Johnson. I actually have a lot of numbers to show you and some math. So I hope you don't hate any of that. Now, I'm sure you have some numbers too, because really what this comes down to, especially Jimmy versus Jeff, it really just comes down to two numbers, doesn't it? These. Now, for any of the Jimmy Johnson fans out there, let me explain what this means. Seven is greater than four. Yeah, it is pretty simple, right? That seals the deal. But this is a little too simple. We really need to figure out what the playoffs are all about. For most NASCAR fans, I'm, that's probably been either the greatest thing that's ever happened to you or the bane of your existence for the last, gosh, two decades? For those not familiar with NASCAR, here's how the playoffs work. Uh, back in the mid-2000s, it's full NASCAR season, it was 36 races. The first 26 races determined who got into the playoffs. It was 10 drivers to start with, as you can see here. And then for the final 10 races, the points for these 10 drivers were reset. So that basically they were now running a 10 race season and whoever got the most points in just those 10 races became the champion, which meant someone who finished 10th in the regular season could win the championship, no matter how far behind they were. It also meant that someone who theoretically won all 26 races at the beginning of the season could also lose the championship. Now, the playoffs have gotten weirder and a lot more complicated since then. Um, it's come down to one race now. We aren't going to get into that part. It really isn't relevant for this discussion. So despite how this championship is run, the general consensus of NASCAR fans is that it still results in the best driver winning. It's easy to think about it that way. It's how it's supposed to work. But it's not that simple. And it really comes down to one major principle. Luck. Despite what people want to believe, luck plays a massive role in how the world operates. And when you set things up a certain way, you can have luck play a much bigger role in how things end up. And look, I'm going to try to cut you off here. I've cut some of you off here, at least. You are very adamant that no matter what the playoffs look like, no matter how they operate, if you win the championship, you're the best driver of the year. Let's think about it this way, shall we? Let's say that you're at a blackjack table. And let's say that you are actually doing really well, better than anyone else at the table. Are you going to leave the table thinking that you were the best blackjack player? Or are you going to leave thinking that you're the luckiest blackjack player? Here's a better question. Which of those statements is more true? Chances are the luck part. And look, luck and Jimmy Johnson go together pretty well, actually. Just ask 2010 Kevin Harvick. This was after a race in California. But that doesn't mean that this type of thought process doesn't apply to other races that Jimmy has run. 
let's just take a look at why luck matters so much with the way the playoffs are set up now in NASCAR. Let's start with something simple. Say I have a coin, and I want you to flip heads 10 times in a row. It doesn't sound terribly difficult. The odds are still against you. I mean, to flip heads, that's 50-50 odds, and you have to do that 10 times in a row. I did the math for you. That basically comes out to your chances of being successful are around a tenth of a percent. So that would make it about one in a thousand tries. But there are ways to make it harder. What if I told you to flip a coin heads 36 times in a row? The more astute of you will probably recognize that I'm using familiar numbers. Do you want to know how much harder that gets? The chances of you doing that are 0.000000015%. Now, I can just say that's really small, or I can tell you how much smaller that is. The odds of you flipping heads 10 times in a row are 67 million times better than the chances of you flipping heads 36 times in a row. Crazy, right? Now just imagine how this principle applies to racing. Now remember, don't forget, flipping heads 10 times in a row is far easier to do than flipping heads 36 times in a row. Put this another way, it's a lot easier to get lucky 10 times than 36 times. We got that? Good. In case you don't, and you're really fighting me on this, let's do one more example. Say you are trying to figure out, out of two people, who the best darts player is. Let's say that you each, that you give them both one dart to throw. What do you think is going to happen? I mean, most of the time, the better player is going to hit close to the bullseye. Let's pretend the bullseye is actually the best spot to hit, even though I know it's the second spot under the 20. Um, so the best player is going to do, you know, better. But what if the worst player got lucky and they actually happened to hit the bullseye and the best player who can't be good all the time misses it slightly? And that's all the evidence you have of who the better darts player is. If you go with the person who throw the bullseye, you're wrong. It's not something to debate. It's a fact. You would be wrong. So what would be the best way to avoid an outcome like this? Well, you give them more darts to throw. Because on average, the best darts player is going to be close to the bullseye. And the worst darts player will be further away. And even though the worst starts player may get close to the bullseye on one or two occasions, the best starts player will be closer on more occasions than that. So the other thing to keep in mind is basically the opposite of the earlier principle. The more opportunities you have to test skill, the more likely you're going to figure out what the actual skill levels are. And you start eliminating luck from the equation. So let's take a look at a real life head-to-head -head NASCAR example. For some of you, you may already know what this season is. In case you don't, it's 2007. Yes, I'm going back to this year because I want to. To start, let's just give you the average finishes for both drivers over all 36 races. For Jeff Gordon, that was 7.3, mainly because he finished in the top 10 30 times out of 36 races. For Jimmy Johnson, it was 10.8, which is really good, but it's 3.5 positions lower than Jeff. To put that into perspective, over just 12 races, in this, in this season, Jeff would have gained 42 positions. 
over Jimmy. And multiply that by three. Yeah, that is three entire races better than Jimmy. And in case you need more confirmation of that, if Jeff had sat out not just Homestead at the end of the year, but also Phoenix, he still would have had more points than Jimmy Johnson. He only needed 34 to get what Johnson did in 36. But of course, the season didn't work out quite this way. Because it was split into two. So this was the first part of the year, the first 26. Jeff averaged 8.2 over these 26 races. Jimmy, 13 actually. And then the points got reset. And for those who watched in 2007, you know what happened. Jimmy Johnson averaged 0.1 position better than Jeff. And it was enough to win the championship. Here's where I'm actually going with this. Jeff's average finish from the first 26 races to the last 10 went up 3.1. That's actually pretty significant. Not a huge jump, but still, it made a difference. This is what Jimmy did. He went from 13 to 5. A difference of 8 positions on average better over those last 10 races. Now, a lot of people out there are of the opinion that this was due to skill. That somehow Jimmy Johnson did so much better at driving over the last 10 races that year. And that's how he beat Jeff Gordon. My question to you is, how does one get better at driving over the course of a season? Just one season. And how does one gain eight positions in one season? Because there's a much easier solution to this than he somehow got better at driving. He got lucky. And if you don't believe me, let's look at some other scenarios. For example, these 10 races, the exact same sample size. Who did better? Jeff Gordon. What about this sample size? Well, Jeff Gordon. What about these 10 races? Jeff Gordon. In these 10 races? Jeff Gordon by a mile. Even these 10 races, the 10 immediately preceding the chase. Jeff Gordon. But this determined the championship. Again, I'm not here to say whether that's fair. I'm just here to tell you, Jimmy Johnson needed a lot more than skill to make this happen. In fact, let's do one more look at how this season played out. Let's take a look at which tracks these drivers, these two drivers, had the best average finishes at. And just a disclaimer, this is as of June 9th, 2020, when I'm making this video, because these averages could very well easily change as Jimmy keeps racing. So for now, these are Jimmy's best tracks. Oh, see, most of them are behind the giant black line I put that splits the regular season from the playoffs. These are Jeff Gordon's best tracks. Actually, a lot of those fall behind the black line too. But I'm going to do one more thing. These are the lowest five tracks by average finish for each driver. And all of a sudden, this doesn't look like so much of an even playing field for these two. Again, that doesn't mean the championship wasn't earned, but it turns out that Jimmy would have had a lot easier time at these tracks than Jeff would have. And maybe that just played into who won the championship that year 
and maybe a lot of championships over a lot of years. Look, if you don't believe me on 2007, please go watch the end of the 2016 championship, the Homestead Miami race. Because Jimmy was in that, and he won the championship this year. But, huh, you know, 36 laps in, look, look at where Jimmy is in the championship four. Yeah. You, unless you've seen that race, you have no idea what kind of convoluted set of incidents it took to get Jimmy to the front of that race. I mean, I would say it's probably more convoluted than any of the deaths in the Final Destination series. It's just unlikely. It was so unlikely to happen, but it did. And we're going to say Jimmy won because he was the best driver? Look, if you don't believe me that the championship really comes down to a lot less than doing well the entire season and proving your skill, <laughs> look at what Denny Hamlin said within the last day. There's no difference between a championship and a race. It's basically the equivalent of looking at Trevor Bain's career and only looking at the one Daytona 500 that he won. If you look at just that and blind yourself to the rest of his career, he looks like a top driver. But you have to look at all the data because that's where you're actually going to find the truth, or as close to the truth as we can get with the data available. And maybe at this point, or probably a lot earlier, you're going to say, hang on. I know what you can do. You can look at Jimmy and Jeff head to head. They both raced against each other for a long time. Let's look at their careers that way. And we can prove that Jimmy was a better driver. Oh, sorry. I spoiled the ending. And also the motivation behind doing this. But we'll do it anyway. Jeff versus Jimmy. 2002 to 2015. Yeah. Jimmy Johnson's stats are better in pretty much everything but polls. For some reason, Jimmy Johnson was never good at qualifying, ever. Here's the thing. These two drivers' careers looked a lot different when they weren't racing each other. In fact, if we look at Jeff not versus Jimmy, and Jimmy not versus Jeff, well, we have these years to work with. And it's a lot more years for Jeff than Jimmy. But it paints an interesting picture. One that looks a lot worse for Jimmy Johnson. By a lot. So let's average out these stats to see if Jimmy looks any better. Oh, no, he does not. Not even a little bit. So does this make sense? Because it really doesn't to me. So basically, when Jeff raced Jimmy, Jeff's stats went down generally. They were worse than his average. But when Jimmy raced Jeff, Jimmy's stats went up. And not just a little up. They went way up. Why would Jimmy do better when racing a really good driver than when... Jeff wasn't around. Huh. Well, we can answer that question together. I mean, maybe it was because Jeff actually made Jimmy Johnson better? Well, I mean, after all, Jeff Gordon was the one that got Jimmy Johnson where he was to start with because Jimmy Johnson's Bush Series ride was basically gone. And there really isn't any other evidence that a different team would have picked him up, especially not a top-tier team. And yet... Jeff Gordon saw something in Jimmy, and it proved to be an incredible move. And Jimmy just got a ride out of thin air at the best team alongside Jeff Gordon. And I think it makes a lot of sense that Jimmy Johnson ended up in the best possible situation. And if any other events would have happened, he probably wouldn't have had nearly as much success 
as he's had up to this point. But of course, this doesn't actually explain why Jimmy raced better against Jeff. It's more along the lines of when Jimmy was racing in the early 2000s, he was in his prime. Jeff Gordon was in his prime in the late 90s. And those are time periods that we can't compare directly. Or can we? Well, let's start big picture, shall we? Let's start with all of their stats forever. At least up until the point when I'm making this video, okay? So that doesn't include the rest of 2020 for Jimmy Johnson, but it includes a chunk of it. And, well, these are the straightforward stats that we have. I mean, wins tells you how good you were at the end of the race. So do top fives and top tens. Polls tell you how good you were before the race, qualifying. And laps led tell you how good you were in the middle of a race. And of course, average rank tells you how good you were after 36 or 10 or one. And it also makes sure to include seasons where you may not have won the championship, but you finished second or 18th, if you like it that way. Um, and of course, because Jeff Gordon has raced far more races in his career than Jimmy ever will, we also have all the averages. And yes, I do also have a category for how many of these uh, stats, whether they're averages or percentages, that each driver actually leads compared to the other. That means I am treating them all equally. You don't have to, but I will. So at this rate, while Jimmy's average rank is 0.2 better than Jeff's, Jeff started better on average, finished better on average, didn't win as often, but definitely finished in the top five more often and the top 10 more often and led more laps on average. So what if we want to make this a little bit closer? What if we look at the same amount of seasons? Now let's say we pick their best five. Well, it looks like that. Even here, now Jimmy has had more race opportunities because for Jeff Gordon, I'm taking seasons where they didn't race 36 the whole year. They race anywhere from, I believe, 31 to 34. We're around there. But the gap grows a little bit. Jimmy gets a bonus for winning five championships in a row, but he didn't start better. He didn't finish better. He definitely didn't win more. He definitely didn't finish in the top five more or the top 10 more, and he definitely didn't lead nearly as many laps. Now, I'm gonna try to cut you off again. Some of you might be saying, oh no, you're cherry picking to make Jeff Gordon look better. I mean, of course anyone would look worse compared to Jeff Gordon's five best seasons. You probably didn't actually pick Jimmy Johnson's best five seasons. Here's why I'm able to do this and not feel like I'm cheating. Because I'm not. Again, these are the five that I've selected for Jeff Gordon. Try to pick any five seasons of Jimmy Johnson's career. Literally any group of five that are better than this. You can't. So of course I'm going to show it to you because that's how the numbers work out. And we can keep doing it for bigger groups of seasons. What about 10? Well, Jimmy's average rank is still higher, but nothing else is. What about 15? It's the exact same story. And in fact, if you include all full-time seasons for Jimmy Johnson and then Jeff Gordon's best 18, he leads every category across the board. It's really as simple as that. So remember what I was saying about putting Jimmy Johnson and Jeff Gordon head to head in their primes? Well, that's what we can do here. What if we look at how they did 
after each season. So we don't look at calendar years. We look at what they did after their first full season. Now, for season one, uh, both Jeff and Jimmy had select races in the year before that, you know, kind of needed to just throw into this. And we see a story to start with here. Uh, I should clarify that, in case you're not aware, this starts for Jeff Gordon in 1993 and for 2002 with Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy Johnson had the far better start to his career than Jeff Gordon. It took quite a bit for Jeff Gordon to get up to speed, you could say. And yeah, Jimmy just started winning a lot. But it doesn't take particularly long before Jeff catches back up and passes Jimmy because of all those late 90 seasons where he won 13 races a year and then 10 and then seven and seven again. And Jimmy never really did that despite all of his opportunities to do so. And it keeps going. At some point, it pretty much levels out in Jeff's favor, of course, until Jeff starts getting into the 2000s, which we get to right about here. This is the point where Jeff reaches the 2002 season. And this is where Jimmy reaches 2011. So all of this before were Jimmy's best seasons. But what we're coming to are some of Jeff's worst. When Jimmy, on the other hand, was still pretty consistent. And it definitely looked at this point in history that Jimmy was on track to start surpassing Jeff in quite a few categories. Until the end of Jimmy Johnson's career, which we are in the midst of right now. For Jeff, on the other hand, these were the late 2000s when he had a resurgence and he was doing very well. And on the flip side, Jimmy Johnson was doing very, very poorly to the point where we come back to that table we had before, where if you compare all 18 seasons, Jeff leads in all the categories. And this isn't Jeff's best 10 seasons because we haven't even reached 2014. But he just kept going. I mean, he is still the Iron Man after all, a title which he probably isn't going to give up anytime soon. So what do we learn with all this? Comparatively, I can't find a way to make Jimmy Johnson better. This is as straightforward as I can get it. It's direct comparison. This doesn't cut out any races. It leaves everything in. It's as much data as I could possibly have. And I can't make Jimmy look better. So if Jimmy isn't even the best of his era, how can he ever be the GOAT? I'm sure some of you still have questions about how this all works out, which is why, for the last time, I'm going to try to stop you from asking them in the comments and instead answer them right here because that seems to be a lot easier. Here's the first one. How can you compare Jeff and Jimmy when Jimmy had harder competition to face in the 2000s? Is this a straw man argument that just makes me look better? Possibly. Have I heard this question before from Jimmy Johnson fans? Yes. And of course, one way to put it is, Jeff Gordon raced in the 2000s and did fine. Why couldn't Jimmy? And the other part is, it's hard to say exactly how the teams and the balance between them has changed from the 90s to the 1000s. But especially right now, I think most NASCAR fans can see that there are about 20 or so drivers that will never win a race. You could bet right now, I would, 
that Corey Willjoy will not win a race this year. He has maybe four opportunities at the super speedways, and that's it. That doesn't mean he's a bad driver, but he's just not on a good team, you know? It makes it a lot easier for people like Jimmy, who are on good teams, to consistently finish in the top 10, the top five, and win, because you don't have as much competition as it appears there is. And there's also more reliability. So, I mean, being able to finish in the top five and top 10 is a lot less hampered by things like mechanical issues and even crashes. So that's kind of bull crap. How can you diminish Jimmy's playoff success when his team just strategizes to do better in those final races? Easy. Because he still raced all the other races. And my point before still stands. The more times you give an opportunity or provide an opportunity to show off skill, the more likely you're going to come to an average because you have that much more data. So... I can't go back into the past and change those races to make Jimmy look better. As much as that might hurt some people. If Jimmy were more skilled than Jeff Gordon, then the stats should show that. And Jimmy should have finished better in his career at a lot more races. But the data doesn't say that. And the data is what it is. Shouldn't we attribute Jimmy's less appealing stats to having a worse car or team, whatever? I love this question. I do hear it a lot, especially in regards to uh, recent Jimmy performances. Uh, what's he at now? Hard in five races without a win? Hard in six, maybe? Sure. Some of that probably does come down to the fact that over the last few years, Chevy generally has taken a nose slide. Hendrick has been doing as well. And, of course, Chad Knauss isn't there. But that begs the second question. All those things I just mentioned aren't related to driver skill. So are all these results that I have, all this data, is it just a proxy for how good your team is? How good your crew chief is? How good your manufacturer is? Instead of how good the driver is? All of a sudden, you end up with the same conclusion that I have for the title of this video. We can't decide a GOAT if there aren't, isn't any data to prove how skilled a driver is. It's the same freaking conversation. Conversation is not the right word. Bitch fight that Corey LaJoy and Denny Hamlin are having right now. If you stick a worse driver in a better car, will they do better? I don't know. My, I'm going to assume that... The effect is minimal, but if it's actually really big, then we don't have to do any of this. Jimmy still isn't the greatest of all time because there isn't one. Congratulations. Why are you crapping all over Jimmy and trying to make him look bad? I'm not. I'm just comparing him to Jeff. And Jeff rates better. It's not my fault. That's Jimmy's. So what's really the point of all this? Why should anyone care? This is the best question of the bunch and the hardest to answer. Here's my take on the situation. In case you didn't hear it before, Jimmy is great, but why does he have to be the greatest? Why does anyone have to be the greatest? Because here's what happens when we have this kind of discussion. Essentially, the idea is to put one driver on a pedestal and make their successes superior to everyone else's in the sport. And generally, that isn't necessarily a bad thing. It doesn't necessarily make what other drivers did irrelevant but it does inherently make other drivers' success less valuable. I'm worried about what's essentially a slippery slope. What happens if this becomes the greatest era of NASCAR? Because we say it is. 
More importantly, because Jimmy Johnson is in it. Dude, there's a lot of history in this sport. What do we do with all of that? Does anyone new coming into the sport, are they ever going to look at that? Does it all just kind of fade away? After all, the greatest driver of all time wasn't there. Really? Especially over this? It shouldn't. Here's something from Kareeb Abdul-Jabbar. about. This is about goats in the NBA, obviously. But I think it translates really well to NASCAR, too. The idea is, there are so many different eras of our sport. A lot of fans already know that comparing what Richard Petty did to what Dale Earnhardt did to what Jeff Gordon did to what Jimmy Johnson did, it's hard. I made it seem really simple here because, like I said, Jeff and Jimmy raced at the same time, but who knows what they would have did, what would have done in Richard Petty's car, or what Dale Earnhardt would have done in Jimmy Johnson's car. The amount of change that's happened in this sport, I think is unprecedented. In any sport. If there's one thing I want to focus on, it's the last sentence there. There can be more than one. And in fact, there doesn't have to be any. But that's not what happens. I mean, especially now. Like I said before, there's all kinds of talk about who actually is the best driver. And we have to butt heads and compare notes, and it ends up being that it's kind of like the NCAA bracket. If there's only one winner, that means there are 63 losers. And history doesn't remember the losers. It's written by the winners. And what you do when you pick a goat and dump all your focus on that, well, you've changed the narrative. I think it, you, you changed the perspective of how the sport is and was. And I know this isn't the case for some people. There are going to be some people out there that are like, look, just because I believe in a goat doesn't mean that I don't think a bunch of other drivers are great. But I don't think that's true. I don't think that's what people actually do. Some, some break the trend. But most people don't think enough to break the trend. Look, I have a test for you, in fact. We're going to switch sports here really quick. We're going to switch to golf. Who's the best golfer of all time? I'm guessing you thought of one of these two people. And 99% of you thought of Tiger Woods. Because they're playing right now. Of course you would. If you're actually a good, like, sorry, good isn't the right word. If you're a fan of golf and have been for a while, then you might have also thought of Jack Nicklaus, Arnold Palmer, or Gary Player. But, did you think of this guy? Who is this guy? I'll give me five seconds to think about it. His name is Bobby Jones. He's, in fact, the only player in the history of golf to win all four majors in the same year. Not hold all four majors in the same year. That's, Tiger did that. The same calendar year, he won U.S. Open, the Open Championship, the U.S. Amateur, and the British Amateur. Full sweep of all the majors at the time. Yes, golf has changed a lot since then in how it's played, but... I mean, Bobby Jones, his name is still written all over the sport, whether you know it or not. You're familiar with the Masters tournament, right? That's his tournament. He co-founded it. It's the biggest event in golf by a mile. So then, why isn't Bobby Jones the automatic greatest of all time? Because he played in the 20s? Pretty much. Because... The media has to focus on something now to get people's attention, and it sure as hell ain't Bobby Jones. But the problem is, is that it makes his legacy harder to find. It means his name isn't coming up in conversations anymore. It means 
And for, for good or bad, I mean, it makes sense that people aren't talking about him anymore. But he should still have name recognition. And I get the feeling that this is probably the first time you've heard this man existed. And that happens in every sport. Football. Is Jim Brown the best football player? Who the hell is Jim Brown? Is Otto Graham the best football player? What? Who's that? An argument about the greatest of all time naturally devolves into who's the greatest now. And it makes everyone in the past look inferior. And it makes them look less worthy of our attention. I don't want NASCAR to be that way. There have been so many great moments in the sport that I believe still will be remembered for a very long time. And a lot of great drivers that will be remembered for a very long time. But how many other drivers are slipping through the cracks? Sure, we have our Mount Rushmore. How soon is it going to be before all oh, of those four drivers are gone? And another four take their place. Uh, NASCAR is more than that. NASCAR has been blessed to have so many skilled athletes get behind the wheel and drive around in circles for fans because it's fun. Because it's just so darn cool. And they may not be the greatest drivers of all time. But they're sh they are damn great. And that should matter to more people, to new fans. That for all of, for as far as they know, NASCAR lives and dies by Jimmy Johnson. I, how is that going to work? Do we want it to work that way? I don't. I, I want more people to study NASCAR and all of NASCAR. Not just the here and now. There's so much more the sport has offered over its many, many decades of existence. And there'll be many more decades to come. NASCAR is far more than one driver. We sure as hell did not get to where we are today because of Jimmy Johnson. We got there because of drivers like everyone here. All of them who kept going at it even though some of them didn't find the success they deserved. These are all beloved drivers that should be beloved today. Seriously, I, does anyone know of a fan of NASCAR that started watching because of Jimmy Johnson? It can't, it can't just be one person. A race takes more than that. I, fuck goats. We should celebrate greatness as it comes and as it goes and not leave anything behind. There's always going to be change in our sport, but there's always room to celebrate those who made it so great. Even Kyle Busch. So in case you didn't get it, the title is totally clickbait. There are no goats. The end. Gosh, you're still here? Look. If I haven't convinced you yet that Jimmy Johnson is not the goat, then I guess I won't. But I can rub it in your face that there is something Jimmy will never do that Jeff Gordon did. My favorite moment in the sport, win number 93. The scheduled distance, 500 laps. This will be a regular attempt at the restart, not a green-white checker. Well, Jamie with a good run off turn two. That's as good as you can hope for. Side by side for the lead as they go into three. McMurray a little higher through three and four. The Clear advantage to the right 24. Here. White flag in the air one more time around for Gordon.
Jeff Gordon looking for a storybook ending to the 2015 season. Out of three and four, this win's going to punch his ticket to the championship four. Gordon wins yeah, in Martinsville. It did not get past me how lucky Jeff Gordon was to win this race. But you know, luck has a funny way of averaging itself out. It has been a boisterous crowd. Burn that baby down! Burn that baby down! I believe this crowd got what they wanted tonight. A lock for the Hall of Fame, Jeff Gordon in his final season in the Sprint Cup Series. Gets win number 93 on his career, and more importantly, he moves into a position where he could get his fifth championship. Thank you all for watching.